At 10, an apology from the Princess of Wales for editing an official photograph, thus increased wild speculation about her condition. We look at some of the telltale signs in the picture that forced Kate's confession that she altered it. No mention of the photo tonight from Prince William as he attends an event for his environmental prize. Please welcome Mr Lee Anderson. He was in Labour, then Deputy Chair of the Conservatives. Now Lee Anderson becomes Reform UK's first MP. In Haiti, as armed gangs roam the streets, fears a million people face famine in the capital. One of the largest NATO military exercises since the end of the Cold War, now including newly joined Finnish and Swedish troops. And the Oscar goes to Killian Murphy. And the first Best Actor Oscar for Ireland as Killian Murphy wins for Oppenheimer. On BBC London, a row over the impact of the ULEZ expansion. The mayor says a report about air quality must wait until after May's election. His rivals disagree. A very good evening to you in seemingly trying to dampen down speculation about her health. It appears the Princess of Wales may have fanned more flames of conspiracy. Kate has now apologised for any confusion after admitting she edited the first official photograph she'd appeared in since undergoing abdominal surgery two months ago. Five picture agencies withdrew the image over concerns it had been manipulated. Why it was altered in the first place, we may never know. Kensington Palace says the original photo will not be released. Well, Daniela Ralph is live at Windsor Castle for us tonight. Daniela. Well, Clive, that controversial photo was taken here in the grounds of Windsor Castle towards the end of last week. It was supposed to make the rumours and the gossip stop. But instead, the scrutiny and the speculation has intensified as palace officials try to manage the fallout. The Prince of Wales this evening at an event related to his Earthshot environmental project in London. At the end of a day filled with unexpected twists and turns. Prince William took this photo of his wife and children that was supposed to reassure, to calm the more outlandish rumours about the princess's condition. But its publication has done the opposite. Today, the princess was seen with her husband being driven from Windsor. Kensington Palace said she had a private appointment. Last night, the first of five news agencies issued dramatically worded kill notices, withdrawing the photo due to what the agency said were inconsistencies in the image. Then this morning, a social media post from the Princess of Wales herself, where she admitted altering the image. She said... Like many amateur photographers, I do occasionally experiment with editing. I wanted to express my apologies for any confusion the family photograph we shared yesterday caused. I hope everyone celebrating had a very happy Mother's Day. Yes, have you got a favourite shot out of all the... Photography is a passion for the princess, reflected in some of her public engagements. And over the years, she's released many of her own pictures with little fuss. But times are different now. The clamour for information on her current condition remains intense and it's fuelled the questions about the photo. They've misled the public by putting an image out there that was manipulated and it's gone and fuelled a whole load of speculation and conspiracy about Kate and her health. At the Commonwealth Day service at Westminster Abbey, it was business as usual, but the royal party was depleted due to the current health problems. The absent king recorded a video message played to the congregation. In recent weeks, I have been most deeply touched by your wonderfully kind and thoughtful good wishes for my health and, in return, can only continue to serve you to the best of my ability throughout the Commonwealth. It has been a challenging few weeks for the royal family and the photo controversy has fed the debate over whether we can trust what the palaces tell the public.
I wouldn't say it's a trust issue. I haven't heard that. I mean, the, the, the Princess of Wales is an accomplished photographer. She said um, she edits photographs. She might have been editing family photographs, you know, for all the time for all we know. A photo altered by a princess. Her team say she was doing what so many others do, trying to make her family look as good as possible in a picture. Daniel Ralph, BBC News, Windsor. OK, let's take a deeper look at the picture. Mariana Spring is here. So, looking at it, what are the telltale signs something's up? So there's no evidence that this was generated using artificial intelligence, but there are various signs that it was edited or altered in some way. So if we take a look, there are three points in the picture we can analyse here that suggest it was probably changed. The first is uh, Princess Charlotte's cardigan sleeve. So you can see how there's that kind of chunk missing on her wrist there. Uh, the next is the zip on uh, the Princess of Wales jacket. You can see that the two bits of the zip don't align with each other. And then finally, um, you've got this hand, a very kind of blurry hand that's on Prince Louis's side on the other side of the image. Um, and so all of this does suggest it's been edited. Um, we've also analysed the data that's attached to the images that were shared with the uh, press, with the media agencies, and they do indicate that it was edited twice using software on a computer. Um, we haven't been able to analyse the original photo because Kensington Palace haven't shared those. OK. Uh, it might seem a bit odd that we're focusing so much on a single picture, but the point was the hope was that it would dampen down speculation about the princess's health. The opposite seems to have happened. Exactly. Um, and, you know, celebrities, high profile people, they edit photos all the time and people often spot inconsistencies in those images. But the difference here is that there's been this very active online conversation and in the media too about the Princess of Wales and her health. Um, and, you know, we were made aware that she wouldn't be making public appearances, but nonetheless, lots of people have had genuine questions about what's going on, details about it, trying to understand what's happening. And then there's also been the more extreme conspiracy theories that have been spreading totally contrary to the evidence or with no evidence at all. Um, and I think that this is a blueprint that I'm seeing a lot now, which is there's a vacuum of information. People have genuine questions. Amateur sleuths get involved and want to comment and add to this. There are conspiracy theories and there's this massive frenzy online and in the media, ultimately with real people at its heart. Indeed. OK, Mariana, thank you. Mariana Spring there. Now, former deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, Lee Anderson, has defected to Reform UK, becoming its first MP. Now, he was suspended by the Tories last month after refusing to apologise for remarks he'd made about the Mayor of London. He says the Conservative Party is stifling free speech and he wants to speak out in Parliament on behalf of millions of people up and down the country, whom he believes shares his views. Chris Mason has that story. Please welcome Mr Lee Anderson. In January, he was deputy chairman of the Conservatives and then resigned. In February, the Tories flung him out of their parliamentary party, leaving him politically homeless. And in March, today, he's joined Reform UK. All I want is my country back. Now, this may sound offensive to the Liberal elite, but it's not offensive to my friends, my family, my constituents and some of my donors. Constituents like my mum and dad, who told me they could not vote for me, unless I joined Reform UK. My parents are both nearly 80, and they get it, and I must not let them down. Get what, you might ask? Well, Reform UK emphasises, among other things, huge cuts in immigration and scrapping the government's net zero carbon commitments. Talk to our viewer who says, blimey, Lee Anderson's been on quite a journey, yeah. formerly in the Labour Party, then a Conservative MP, Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party until yeah. not so yeah. long ago now in reform yeah. what's going on there i'm looking to make my help make my country a better place and if i can't find it in a particular i'll go i'll go somewhere i think i found the place now which is, is speaking my language it's definitely speaking the language of my parents and people like them all around the country uh, and some people may say i'm a political journeyman i'm not really interested in what people have got to say all i'm interested in is what people in ashfield have got to say come the election day and in ashfield in nottinghamshire reform won't be any sort of power anyway but he is good for the local community. I have to say that, he really is good. He gets things shifted, he gets things done. I'm just fed up with all politics and, you know, country seems to be going down and down and down. I'm joined by our brilliant PM, Mr Sunak. This was Lee Anderson around eight weeks ago with the Prime Minister. Enter next the Home Secretary this lunchtime. 
Lee is someone who I've, uh, I've worked with. Um, I, I like him personally. I think he's made a real mistake. I think he's made a real mistake uh, because as he has said in his own words, a reform is not the answer and a vote for reform will only let in a Labour government. What I think this reveals is the sheer chaos in the Conservative Party, a government divided from top to bottom and Rishi Sunak too weak to exert any authority and a divided government cannot govern in the interests of the country. I think people have had enough of this. So Reform UK have their first MP. The question now, what does this mean? That is the question. We heard what the Conservatives and Labour think. What do you believe this amounts to in the, in the grand scheme of things? There's a curious paradox, Clive, at the heart of party politics, which is that the most important people in a democracy are those who do change their mind between elections in terms of who they vote for. And yet those who defect at Westminster, such a tribal place, are regarded as exotic, even a bit weird. Now, from Lee Anderson's perspective, He'd already been slung out of the Conservative Parliamentary Party, so here was a man looking for a port in a political storm of his own making. So it was a much easier decision for him because the journey had already started compared with somebody sitting in one of the established parties and imagining that leap. But the reason it matters is that it gives reform some momentum, some publicity. It also punches an existing Conservative bruise. Not only are the Conservatives fearful of how well Labour are doing in the opinion polls, they're also fearful of reform because they fear a disproportionate number of former Conservative voters might be lured towards reform. Now, that doesn't mean reform will necessarily win many, if any, seats come the general election, but they could do disproportionate damage to the Conservatives. Now, the Tories hope that come the general election, enough voters are aware of the consequences of a reform vote and might fall back on the Conservatives in the end. Others privately really, really do fear that what we've seen today personifies what they see as the, the shrinking of the, the big Conservative tent that Boris Johnson so successfully constructed back in 2019. Fascinating. OK, Chris, thank you. Chris Mason, our political editor. Police are working to formally identify 34 bodies they've removed from the premises of a funeral home in Hull. Now, it follows calls from members of the public over concerns for the care of the deceased. A 46-year-old man and a 23-year-old woman have been arrested. Danny Savage has that story. Police investigations at a funeral home. 34 bodies have been removed from here following concern for care of the deceased. A local celebrant says families have been left in turmoil, worried about what happened to dead relatives or loved ones and how they were treated while they were here. Biddy Jo Suffill says her brother and father's cremations were handled by the funeral home. Oh, wow, I've never think I've had a breakdown. It's, it's like something out of an horror movie, isn't it? And like, just like the thought of what if, like, the thoughts that I've gone and made have been like, quite overwhelming. So, like, I've panicked, I've rang numbers, I've rang everyone, I've contacted you. I just want answers now, I just need to know. Humberside police say a 46-year-old man and a 23-year-old woman remain in custody. They were arrested on suspicion of prevention of a lawful and decent burial, fraud by false representation and fraud by abuse of position. A special telephone line also remains open for anyone with concerns and has so far received more than 350 calls. The main emotion we're having from people is they have so many questions and obviously at the beginning of the investigation it's really difficult to find those answers but I, I do want to reassure people that the police are working incredibly hard. They really are doing an amazing job. There are more questions than answers about what happened here. People who've used this funeral home fear they may be affected by this investigation. Danny Savage, BBC News, Hull. America's top diplomat is in Jamaica for crisis talks on the worsening situation in Haiti. The EU has evacuated all of its diplomatic staff from the island nation after large-scale jailbreaks involving around 4,000 prisoners. Now, there are warnings that more than a million people could be facing famine in the capital, Port-au-Prince, where armed groups are fighting in the streets for political control, as Will Grant explains. Haiti is in freefall towards total anarchy. 
The past few days have seen a relentless escalation of violence as gunmen roam the streets, firing on police and attacking government buildings. The situation was already at breaking point. Gangs opposed to the country's unelected Prime Minister, Ariel Henry, have rained bullets on the international airport, closing it down. When he attempted to return to Haiti last week, his plane was turned away. In his absence, gangs now control more than 80% of the capital. Police stations are a particular target. Haiti's main gang leader, Jimmy Barbecue Cherezier, says he's prepared to take the country to civil war unless Mr. Andre resigns. There are growing fears of an exodus. Millions of Haitians now face famine, a humanitarian emergency on top of the breakdown in law and order. A lucky few did manage to get out. US military personnel airlifted its non-essential embassy staff to safety. <laughs> Meanwhile, the situation in the general hospital in Port-au-Prince is especially dire. A dead body lies near patients waiting in vain for treatment, rapidly decomposing in the Caribbean heat. Except for the patients, the hospital is abandoned. There are no doctors. They all fled last week, said this patient. We hear the explosions and gunfire outside, but we must have courage and stay here. Others have no choice but to take their chances amid the violence and chaos. I've got three kids. I'm their mother and their father. Gunmen came here and stole all our money. But when you have three mouths to feed, what can you do? The anxiety is killing me. What if I get shot dead? Who will take care of my children then? With no sign of an end to the crisis in sight, regional leaders and the US Secretary of State have met in Jamaica for an emergency summit. On this evidence, though, Haiti is now perilously close to becoming a failed state. Will Grant, BBC News. For the first time since it officially joined NATO, the Swedish flag has been raised in a ceremony at the alliance's headquarters in Brussels. Both Sweden and Finland, which have cast aside their neutrality, have been taking part in the largest NATO military exercise since the end of the Cold War. All this amid warnings of a renewed threat to Europe from Russia following its full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Jonathan Beale reports now from the Arctic Circle. NATO says it's a bulwark for peace, but it's preparing for war. This just part of its massive military exercise taking place right across Europe. And with newest members, Sweden and Finland, in no doubt as to why they've joined. Being alone against Russia is like, why take that risk when you can join NATO? I personally feel a lot safer because now we have allies to depend on. In this scenario, they've come to defend northern Norway after it's been invaded. They're not calling the enemy Russia, but it is a near neighbour. The aim of this exercise is to demonstrate how NATO would come to the aid of an ally under attack. It is the very principle of the alliance. An attack on one is an attack on all. But just how likely is that? No one's saying the threat is imminent. Russia's preoccupied with its war in Ukraine. But it is Moscow's aggression that's sounding the alarm. The important thing is, it's not if they will reinforce themselves, it's how long will it take. You're that's sure it. Russia is a threat? I'm sure that Russia is a threat, yes. And that we need to become even stronger as an allied country uh, in the upcoming five and ten years. It's those living closest who are most aware of the threat. The country is now boosting defence spending, but also mentally preparing themselves for war. Both Finland and Norway share a border with Russia. And they've already strengthened their defences with a citizen army. Teachers, nurses and carpenters. There are also part-time soldiers. These are members of Norway's Home Guard. But it's no dad's army. Most are young and ready to fight. You know, in World War II, this uh, county was burned down, the whole county. So my uh, grandparents, everyone, they had to flee. And uh, yeah, so if that's my option, I'll just stay here and fight and do something I'm trained for. I'd rather stay in, here and fight, yeah. I 
look at the newspaper more often now than I did before, just to see if there's something um, something that's happened, or yeah, especially with Russia. For these Nordic allies, it is now strength in numbers. But for Russia, it's the mother of all unintended consequences. More NATO on its border. Jonathan Beale, BBC News, The Arctic Circle. A 25-year-old man has pleaded guilty to manslaughter in what's thought to be the UK's biggest catfish child abuse investigation. Catfishing is when online scammers use a fake identity to trick their victims. Alexander McCartney from Newry in Northern Ireland has admitted more than 180 charges, including the manslaughter of a 12-year-old girl who took her own life after being blackmailed by him. Vaughan Gething, the former Welsh health minister and in the running to become first minister, has told the COVID inquiry he's embarrassed that most of his WhatsApp messages from the pandemic have been deleted. Giving evidence at the hearing in Cardiff, he said he tried to recover the information from the device. It's a point of embarrassment. Uh, and if I had been able to provide all of those records, then I don't think that this would really be the issue that I understand it is for a number of people. Now, it's devastated bird populations around the world, and now it's been confirmed that penguins, for the first time in the sub-Antarctic, have tested positive for bird flu. The virus has been discovered in the Gentoos and king penguins. Now, hundreds of thousands of them live in South Georgia and Ireland, teeming with bird life, as Rebecca Morell now explains. They come to the islands of South Georgia to nest and raise their chicks. Gen 2 penguins are a vital part of a wildlife haven. But now avian flu has arrived and five Gen 2s have tested positive. Five more cases have been detected in a separate king penguin colony too. It's the first time this deadly virus has been confirmed in penguins in the sub-Antarctic. South Georgia is a spectacular island. There are some unique concentrations of wildlife, most of which are globally important. So if bird flu were to take a hold and cause very high mortalities across the island, it would, would be of conservation concern. Scientists think migratory birds, skewers and giant petrels brought avian flu from South America. But these birds also migrate to Antarctica. And the fear is they'll carry the virus to this pristine wilderness and infect more species there, like emperor penguins already under threat from climate change as the sea ice vanishes. But there are still many unknowns about how the virus will spread. Penguins do form colonies and, and live in very close proximity to each other. So that, that in itself would lend itself to the idea that they might spread the virus rapidly between each other. Um, but we don't know how susceptible penguins are. We know that there have been die-offs in penguins, but we don't know how easily the virus can get into to different penguin species. Avian flu has already devastated wild birds around the world, including tens of thousands in the UK. It's crossing over into mammals too. With a virus so widespread, it's been a question of when, not if, it would arrive in the South Polar region. So far, it's only had a small impact on the penguins there, but scientists will be monitoring the colonies closely. Rebecca Morell, BBC News. The value of the cryptocurrency Bitcoin raced to an all-time high today. The new price is above $72,000. Earlier this year, U.S. regulators made it easier for investors to trade the currency, which has helped fuel the record-breaking run. And now the U.K.'s financial watchdog says it will loosen some of the rules too. Here's Joe Tidy. For the last two years, lines charting the value of Bitcoin have mostly been in one direction. But in the last few weeks... It's all changed. Almost hourly now, this virtual currency is hitting new all-time highs. The reason? Well, it's mostly down to this place. In January, traders from US investment giants were given the green light by US watchdogs to start selling products linked directly to Bitcoin. As a result, they've spent billions buying up coins. Further stoking the fire, today, UK financial authorities say they too are open to allowing some trading based on crypto assets. Some are now wondering just how far this virtual currency can go. Some people think that the potential of Bitcoin is to replace all other currencies. And there are shops and restaurants like this one in London that accept Bitcoin. I just bought this £7 burger, for example, which was 0.00009 Bitcoin. But the way prices are going now, who knows what it'll be worth tomorrow? 
I don't think we're going to see Bitcoin becoming a genuine currency. What I think we're seeing it become is a recognised and potentially widely used investment asset. People buying it to um, save for the longer term and to benefit from the price rises. Bitcoin was created by an anonymous internet user in 2009 to make sending money as easy as sending an email, all without needing any financial institutions. Bitcoin transactions are processed by a huge network of volunteers who use computers to check transactions. As a reward, they're automatically given new coins. Right now, the demand for those coins seems to be higher than ever, and many Bitcoin fans are celebrating their newfound riches. Others, though, are wondering with caution which way the notoriously unpredictable line will go next. Joe Tidy, BBC News. At the Oscars, it was a night to remember for the big winner, the film Oppenheimer, which scooped no fewer than seven awards, including Best Picture, Best Director for Christopher Nolan and Best Actor for Killian Murphy. And while Barbie was last year's highest grossing film, it won just a single award for Best Song. Well, Katie Russell is live in Los Angeles for us now. Um, just bring us up to date with the fact that a few people have been knocking about the champagne, probably relaxing now. Well, yes, Clive, good evening from Hollywood, where the red carpet's already been packed away and the glad rags put back in the cupboards. But a successful 96 Academy Awards. When I interviewed Christopher Nolan last year, he told me he started making movies when he was seven or eight after he borrowed his dad's Super 8 camera. Well, that has paid off 45 years on with Oscars. Uh, that felt fairly predictable, set in stone for months, on a night of very few surprises, a night when the Academy rode the Barbie popularity wave with some hot pink entertainment. I'm just Ryan Gosling and a stage full of Kens brought the Oscars house down. The film only walked away with one actual award, but Barbie and this performance stole the show. The question was, how big would rival Oppenheimer go? It didn't break records, thanks to wins by a quirky Frankenstein-esque movie. Poor things. Mainly for British creative talent behind the camera. Wow, this is crazy. And in the most nail-biting race of the night for its lead. Emma Stone. And her original unpredictable performance. Um, my dress is broken. <laughs> I think it happened during I'm Just Ken. <laughs> An unplanned wardrobe malfunction in a ceremony planned to the hilt. Complete with gimmicks. John Cena giving out the Oscar for best costume without one of his own. The dog from Anatomy of a Fall watching on. There were serious moments too. The director of The Zone of Interest, whose Holocaust film in German won Best International Feature, the first British movie ever to do that, used the podium to call for peace. Whether the victims of October the 7th in Israel or the ongoing attack on Gaza, all the victims of this dehumanization. How do we resist? Divine. But the big awards went mainly as predicted. Davine Joy Randolph was always a dead sir for Best Supporting Actress. And now I realize I just need to be myself. And I thank you. And the Oscar goes to... It was Oppenheimer's night, though. First Oscars for Robert Downey Jr. as Best Supporting Actor... Killian Murphy. ..and for Killian Murphy, who completed his sweep of the awards season. I would really like to dedicate this to the peacemakers everywhere. And the Oscar goes to... Christopher Nolan Oppenheimer. Christopher Nolan, rewarded unusually in recent Oscar years, for a big-budget film people actually went to see. Movies are just a little bit over 100 years old. We don't know where this incredible journey is going from here. But to know that you think that I'm a meaningful part of it means the world to me. Thank you very much. Even if the best picture announcement by Al Pacino was a bit abrupt. And Maria is C. Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer triumphed. But the most popular film of the year, Barbie, won for sheer entertainment value. Katie Razzle, BBC News, Los Angeles. And the Oscar for worst wet weather goes to the United Kingdom.
<laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and unfortunately, Clive, this is a very familiar picture for many of us at the moment. Even though it hasn't rained today, there's just nowhere for that water to go. So there are numerous flood warnings in force for groundwater flooding. The warnings as ever can be found on the website. And with more rain to come, it's already marching into the south and west now. This is the week ahead. You can see for many of us, a good 30 to 40 millimetres of rain will fall once again in some areas more than that. As I say, the next one's already marching in. Pretty wet through Northern Ireland by the end of the night. Wales, central and western England. In fact, heading towards the southeast. Some really miserable weather to drive in because there'll be lots of standing water on the fast routes. There's nowhere for that rain to go. Further into eastern areas, a little bit on the chillier side here. Some patchy mist and fog, perhaps frost in the north very locally. But it's milder, it's windier, and it's wetter for many parts, as you can see. Particularly England and Wales, Northern Ireland initially. It should move out of the way, but it will give significant significant rain to many of us and more flooding issues. Showery rain heads on behind it, a stronger wind, but a milder direction, 12 to 14 tomorrow. Still that chilly breeze up in the far north of Scotland where there may be a little bit of brightness, but come tomorrow night, well, this low pressure's moving in here. Windier weather then will result as well as more rain. By Wednesday, pushing its way southwards, likely to become slow moving, potentially across Northern England and Northern Ireland, North Wales. To the south of that, if we see some brighter weather, possibly 15 or 16 even. To the north of that, a little bit chillier, the showers could still be a tad wintry on the tops of the Scottish mountains. But that milder air is then moving northwards again as we head towards the end of the week. So we are looking at the prospect of some 16s and 17s, well above average climate. Life, but it stays really unsettled. Yeah. All right. Helen, thank you. Helen Willits there. And that's it. Newsnight is getting underway over on BBC Two with Kirsty over there in Paisley. And on BBC One, it's time to join our colleagues for the news wherever you are. Have a very good night.